Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK today. I am delighted to be joined by Kat Howard, Assistant Principal at Dunstan School in Northampton. Good afternoon, Kat. How are you? Hello, I'm good, thank you, Ross. Thank you for um, inviting me along. No, uh, well, the reason I, I've got in touch is uh, your wonderful book, which I've got in my hand. And I know you have a, a second one, which I failed to pronounce correctly. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But um, start <laughs> about wellbeing. Let's get straight to business. Uh, tell our listeners um, what this book is about in particular. Um, it was looking at how sometimes we might approach well-being in a little bit of a tokenistic, well-meant, but token, tokenistic fashion in schools, and actually how we can look at the systems and creating the, the correct conditions for teachers to mm. feel a sense of empowerment and feel fired up and, you know, and just a general sense of well-being about coming into, um, coming into work every day, but as a result of, you know, workload reduction rather than um, kind of one-size-fits-all well-being strategies mm. sometimes that we see in schools. And it's, um, I mean, I, I particularly enjoyed it uh, from, from at least the social media perception. A lot of people have really enjoyed uh, all the strategies and all the case studies. Could you uh, unpick maybe one of your highlights of the case studies of the people that you worked with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it's a funny, um, it's a funny way that I came about the role that I'm in now because I originally interviewed Sam, um, our head at Dustin, um, before I, I, I got the job there. So as a result of wanting to um, look at the way that Dustin have approached workload reduction. So one of the ways that we approach it as a whole school is um, we have a workload charter mm -hmm. where we commit to staff. Um, several different systems that we actually um, have put into place to make sure that we are really mindful of workload. Um, so things like making sure that we hand over a significant amount of time for CPD because we want people to not feel isolated and we want people to be able to have conversations around their subject and around teaching and pedagogy because we all know that that's what you know keeps us really engaged and really enthusiastic about being in work. But in order for those things to take place, we need to make sure that the time is given to do so and that we remove any barriers to that so things like we have email embargoes we don't send emails at weekends or holidays um, right. and we have a real kind of whole school approach in that we do daily messages which is where all of our kind of key communications are centrally collected and emailed out once a day to reduce on reduce um, email communication we really encourage face-to-face -face conversation mm -hmm. and if anything we had kind of prior to covid had an increased meeting time with the premise of if you don't need the meeting don't have it for the sake of having a meeting yeah. but actually people need opportunities to to meet and have conversations um so those are a few examples i talk a great deal in the book about communication generally um mm. i think emails are the the depth of the conversation almost oh, yes. within schools um and i think that we use yeah definitely and we use email in such a funny way in education because it's it's really it's not necessarily because it's the most effective way to communicate um but it's almost conversation so i think um school leaders really need to be mindful of making sure that people have opportunities to talk to one another mm -hmm. um, because that's what gets the really meaningful gritty work done and actually those conversations are what build relationships sure and um you no know, so covid how's your school responded you know with the kind of workload well-being issues uh, over this last six months yeah so we have we essentially just wiped everything from the calendar that wasn't absolutely necessary um, so things like any external reviews or um, any kind of QA or any meetings that were taking place that we didn't necessarily need to have any kind of connections to data because we know data is in in flux at the moment um, and with where children are and actually just take it back to the nuts and bolts of what do we need in order to make sure that teachers can go home as soon as the day is over um, and that we put that emphasis back on CPD so we've really kind of cleared the calendar um, we used whole class feedback as an approach as a whole school um, institutionally anyway so we've really put the emphasis on that and making sure that things like um, remote learning work any work that's submitted via remote learning we um, we still continue to use the whole class feedback 
um, sheets, which really reduces. And um, we've also said, you know, don't don't take marking home, don't take marking out of the building. Um, mm. If you're doing whole class feedback, it should only take you 20 to 30 minutes. So, you know, don't don't take it home with you and let it sit in the corner of your house staring at you all weekend or in the boot of your car thinking about it and then you know bring it back to work because we all know that's what we do with it um but i think there's so much to be learned from and we're kind of in conversations about what can we learn from this period of time um to remove systems that you know if we've gone this long without we don't need anymore um and i think that's going to be the yeah the the silver lining if i could put you on the spot what's the one thing that your school's speculating on potentially uh getting rid of if there was not one. bringing back well we've kind of handed it over to the staff so our plan is to um we have one-to-ones with every single member of staff in the building um at two points in the year so we've had it earlier on but part of that conversation is how are things going in covid and also later on in the day just after christmas um we'll be putting a survey out to say you know what what lessons have we learned what have we taken away S- really simple things like um we've got a staggered start for school students coming in in the morning um, yeah. and we meet them all at lineups it makes it really easy for tutors to hold students to account when it comes to uniform expectations because you've got the presence of slt there and mm-hmm. it's things like that that actually make those conversations that sometimes can be really really time consuming as a teacher or a tutor in school um that we we just you know have made i think so much easier but part of that conversation i think anything that you change at a whole school level it, it needs to have, it's that dual narrative. You, you need to make sure that you're including teachers at ground level that are going to be impacted by those decisions mm-hmm. before you start looking at what you do or don't bring back. So it's probably a very roundabout way of un- asking, yeah. answering your question, but uh, it needs uh, to it, be, yeah, the teachers uh, need to be involved in that. Yeah, as you know, I've been fascinated with workload for many years. Um, what, mm. just for context for listeners, can we just rewind, you know, give, give us a little insight into your leadership journey and what inspired you to become a school leader and I guess, where did that workload issue or passion from you stem from, I suppose? So um, uh, you back yeah. that first. Yeah, so I used to work in the financial sector for um, a number of years in the retail um, section of a high street bank. I was um, I oversaw recruitment and retention. So essentially my job was to measure how many people were coming in and how many people were leaving because it was incredibly expensive to train people. And it was, you know, so it was really expensive if we trained them just for them to go somewhere else. And mm-hmm. um, so it was really about kind of how do we look after staff? Um, I then decided to retrain as a teacher and went back to university and um, and then went on to do my PGCE and then um, worked in a number of schools and um, and found it really interesting that when I looked around for people that I did my PGCE with, how many were left after about four years and then five yeah. years and then six years um, and what was impacting that and having some really kind of unfortunate conversations with with colleagues and friends around toxic schools and around um that kind of loss of humanity that i think that when systems um are under pressure that that's how school leaders perhaps may react as a result of pressure being projected onto them as well and i found that really interesting but also really frustrating because a lot of the systems in schools didn't really seem to make sense we have a lot of systems in schools where the left hand isn't talking to the right hand um and so you find that particularly with um when you've got slt that have got a particular agenda so the behavior guy or what girl do you think that stems from do you think that stems from ofsted forces lack of finances or lack of maybe leadership training yeah see i've had this debate with tom rogers previously who is quite happy to put it down all to offset but i don't necessarily think that's the case i think that we could really do with learning from and mary Mites is this very nice as well learning from other sectors and their experiences of how to train people in you know hr operations of the art of having difficult conversations but still building relational trust yeah. um so things like that are really really important we could do far more of that i think in teaching because if you what happens is that you become a school leader because you're really good at teaching not necessarily because of all the other operational stuff that you also Uh, need to be really good at learn on your feet so to speak isn't it make a few mistakes and uh hope not too much collateral damage um what what's your um you know including covid i suppose but what do you get out of being a school leader 
I love being school leader. Um, I think um, I'm really excited. I'm really privileged because I um, oversee professional development. Um, and as part of our performance management model this year, um, after running a pilot last year, we're now we've got coaching as an integral part of our performance management. So we're no longer measuring outcomes or data. Um, staff form their own goals and then they take those goals. They own those and, and take those through with um, coaching conversations that we protect time for those coaching conversations. Sounds like great school for um, I find that. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's fantastic. And it's fantastic to be part of that, that process and part of those decisions, you know, yeah. so um, bringing in coaching as part of the performance management policy was really important to me. And I'm, you know, I'm very lucky that I have that autonomy. Um, but I think that, yeah, that, I, that's the best part of enabling people and stuff in schools to have conversations about how things are going away from accountability away from this sense of judgment of actually as you said about mistakes of making it completely acceptable to make I was going to ask you because a, mistakes are inevitable question. yeah um, to getting better is there a mistake that you've <laughs> made that you you know we've all made them what's what's a clanger that you've made that you regret and you hope to never I, again? I'm I make mistakes every single day I share an office with two people that could give you an insight yeah every single I think we all do that don't we especially when you're um managing people uh, or you're going through change management I think that if I look back over to I I had a role in a previous school quite early in my career of literacy coordinator and it's that thing as soon as you're given some sort of responsibility I think at an early point in your career you just want to change it all and make it all your own and I think um, that would be probably the biggest um, mistake that I've made is not sitting back and thinking about what's working and building on that and, and sometimes I think yeah we're very keen to reinvent the wheel when there's there's plenty to be learned from I think listening more definitely um, is something yeah. I've in terms, you know, COVID aside, do, right, yeah, with all the, you know, COVID aside with all the things we're doing remotely at the, at the moment, mm -hmm. what, where was your teaching and learning strategy going at the moment? You know, the retrieval, your cognitive science aspects of learning. Uh, what are your school priorities in that regard? Well, uh, we've done a great deal of work on curriculum over the last two years and whole school curriculum um so we our, our 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 school improvement plan is doing the same but even better so every year we're building on the successes that we're we're building on the strengths that we have and so it was whole school curriculum then we were looking at subject curriculum so this year it was all going to be about kind of um mapping across the curriculum making sure that we've got kind of concepts mapped out that we're revisiting information our classroom routines are really really strong because we have several institutional approaches to that right. um so i would say that our kind of our focus now is making sure that our subject curriculum particularly because we're an all through school particularly at those transition points so we've got our first lot of year six through this year so key stage two to key stage three key stage three to four four to five that those transition points are really well mapped out no i am um, my son before um you know so listeners will know i've left london after 30 years my son was in an all through uh, state school um three to 18 and what i loved as a parent was seeing him being immersed with the teachers in different uh, aspects of the key stages and him being exposed very early to secondary school life you know the older kids bigger classrooms is, is that the kind of structure you have in your own setup i assume it is and do your teachers mix over the key stages in some places? Yeah, so our, our PE um, department work very closely with the primary and their primary curriculum. So we have a secondary specialist that puts the primary curriculum together and goes over and works with the primary teachers. We have our language specialist working in the primary school mm -hmm. on a regular basis and um, the music teachers um pshe um that's a that's an all through curriculum um, and so it is really nice and really beneficial you know i feel very privileged to be able to to walk over to the primary and learn from them mm. and i also think having worked in secondaries previously where you don't have that luxury i think we can sometimes underestimate what primary school school Absolutely. children are capable of um and so seeing that is actually very eye-opening for a, our own I've teachers I've got a colleague at Cambridge that, are. sorry to interrupt you but um, a colleague at Cambridge is researching all That's through right. state schools and um she's discovered that those schools don't have that year six to seven transition dip for obvious reasons so um I guess there's huge benefits of having an all through school, but your point on what you can learn from the other side, so to speak, uh, that's mm. something I've seen on my travels. Uh, give me give me a couple of things that you have learned from the primary classroom. 
Yeah, so I mean, I used to go in a in a previous role. I used to go regularly to moderation meetings for year six, which is, as I say, really, really eye opening. The other piece of work that we did um, previously was to create a transition unit um, for core subjects, so that they almost do half of the unit up to the end of year six, because you have that weird dead time in between the SATs and the summer period. Yeah, you do. To actually ensure that yeah that children remain motivated is to carry out half a unit and then they bring that work with them up to the secondary so it becomes this seamless act from one from one phase to the other and it also enables your teachers to work collaboratively as well that you've got secondary and primary having those conversations together to map out what that might look like now um you've got a new book out i'm going to try and pronounce the name symbosis Symbi <laughs> symbiosis symbiosis right. <laughs> So um, I haven't got my hands on a copy yet. I have seen it circulated on social media. Give everyone the kind of 30 second lift pitch. What, what, what's in it? It was a seed of an idea from Stop Talking About Wellbeing, where I wanted to talk about how important it is to teach a decent curriculum as a teacher. Um, and so what Claire and I wanted to do is put together a, a handbook for leaders of curriculum. So senior leaders, subject leaders and the classroom teacher, which I think we underestimate how how you know, how much they are a contributing factor to a decent curriculum and talk about the underpinning principles of what makes um, a high standard um, of a quality curriculum and how we go about doing that in schools. Now, can I push you in the corner and could you give me some of the kind of key terms or hallmarks of a good curriculum? Yeah, I think that you need to have an understanding of knowledge structures and, and you need to have an understanding of the nuances of the subject. So I can't come into a school and say, right, OK, this is how good this is what good curriculum looks like, because mm -hmm. actually a high quality of curriculum in maths mm -hmm. is entirely different as a hierarchical subject to a high quality curriculum in English. Mm -hmm. So the book almost acts as a guide as to, OK, how can senior leaders, if we go back to well-being and workload, how can senior leaders remove everything and communicate curriculum as a priority? But, and hand over that autonomy to subject leaders because you need to be an expert of the subject in order to put together a decent curriculum. But um, as a starting point, I think as a subject expert, you need to know your subject. Mm -hmm. um, you need to understand what the, the kind of the, the threshold concepts of your subject are. Um, and then you need to understand um, how that kind of maps itself across a, a sense of progression so that you're not repeating content, as we've sometimes seen when we've, you know, kind of flirted mm -hmm. with, haven't we, stage three is two year, three year curriculum back and forth. Um, but also that we're, yeah, we're enabling students to rebump into those concepts rather than just doing the same stuff over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, so yeah, I, I, I know of Claire. I haven't had the chance to catch up with her yet. How how how, is, how did you uh, meet Claire, and how did you end up both writing a book together? Yeah, it's a do you know what our, our friendship is incredibly weird. Um, but um, we met at a Team English conference very very briefly, and then I was doing some work with. Um, I was kind of putting together Lit Drive, very early days of Lit Drive, and um, asked Claire if she would like to be involved as part of the senior team to run the network side of things for our regional events. Um, and we got to know each other from there. And so we pr mm. probably spent far more time talking over Zoom than we have actually right. been in real life. So we make a we make an effort of twice a year of making sure that we go down to London and have lunch and, and drinks. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of these back and forth conversations of, of being really interested in how lots of people know the what of the curriculum what what might be on you know if i'm an english teacher what might a, a good english curriculum look like but not necessarily how to go about it or how to involve a team in that process as well and actually how empowering that can be for teachers so yeah an odd one no uh, really fascinating the curriculum discussion now um claire when i once once i pass the 20 minute mark i then throw loads of quick fire questions at you so you can't pause or hesitate and my, <laughs> my plan is to kind of catch you out um, so I'll start off easy. Um, what, what, what project are you currently working on in school? Um, in school, I want to evaluate our coaching process. I want to make sure that staff feel really confident in knowing what a coaching conversation looks like. So that's my priority at the moment. OK, what does symbiosis mean? symbiosis is this interaction so this kind of this this intrinsic connection between one thing and the other so it's making sure that we're not talking about classroom practice as detached from curriculum the third time i got it right um okay what book are you reading <laughs> 16 hours what book are you reading 
Um, I am reading Evaluating Professional Development by Thomas Guskey, and I'm listening to Hannet for my book club, my very geeky book club right. on Twitter. And um, what's your top tip to your NQTs during COVID? Um, make sure you get enough sleep. Okay, your own well-being advice to yourself? Have Sundays off, always. Never say yes to something on a Sunday. <laughs> That's a good one, I like that. Um, I, use, I use Saturdays. Um, piece of advice for a teacher curious about research? Um, I would say get yourself onto research at home as a starting point. That's an interesting um, look. Also, have a look at what learning scientists are doing because that's probably going to be integral to your practice. Yeah, they're very, very good. Um, what's your biggest uh, or most proud achievement? Writing two books in a year. Yeah, <laughs> that was, was ridiculous. I was going to tell you what's your secret. I, I struggled to get one out. Of a couple of years. Um, My what, children what, don't sleep, so. What, what is your secret? <laughs> There's the question. What's your secret? <laughs> um, yeah, no, not sleeping. So. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm assuming teaching is your dream job, but what is that off the wall uh, curveball career that you you would have loved to have done? I would like to, I'd really wish that I'd learned piano. Um, we had to get rid of our piano a couple of years ago and I, right. I didn't get around to teaching myself properly. So yeah, that would be the dream. Okay, who would you, into, uh, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, that's so hard. Um, I would say that you should interview Dave Goodwin, because just for the fact that he is so northern, I could listen to him talk about practically anything. However, his knowledge on graphic organisers is out of this world. So right. I find him really interesting okay, to listen to. I'll hunt him down. Okay, uh, where can listeners find out more about you and you know connect online? Um, I am at Sesmis on Twitter. I also blog at sesmis.wordpress.com and I fit about doing stuff with lit drive so you can find that at um at lit drive uk or www.litdrive.org.uk right. my final question kat is uh what do you hope to be your legacy um people not leaving teaching would be really nice that makes yeah, me really that sad so that would, that would make my day that would be a really interesting one i'd be curious to know how many people are still in the classroom when i qualified actually but um yeah the, as we all know the attrition rate is pretty shocking isn't it um, I, I, one question I didn't ask is, uh, you know, how many years yeah, have you people, put into People that send a DM saying... Um, how many years have you put into I'm, the you I'm, I'm on my eighth, I think. Yeah. Okay, so you get into the itch. The average lifespan of teachers in England is 13 years. So um, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. But um, no, I'm not done yeah. Kat, thank you for your time. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure to chat with you. I can't wait to find out about more about your new book, Symbiosis. That was a very fascinating description of how it all connects together. And for people listening, stop talking about well-being. Um, it's a fantastic book, really informed some of my thinking in terms of teacher workload and well-being. Um, and I wish you all the best, Kat. I look forward to the third book. <laughs> Lovely. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> take care. Okay, take care. Um, <laughs>